You ready to get into the Word of God together this morning? We have got some more work to do. This is the second of three services, the third of five this weekend. So I'm already looking forward to a nap, but we're not there yet. Second Timothy, go with me there this morning. Second Timothy, let's begin in chapter two. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I want to do what we can to, to recap where we, were, where we were in the last service, but I think as the Lord leads us, we're going to add on to it. So I encourage you to go back and get what we've already established this morning. I believe it's going to be a help to you. There's some amazing revelation in there that is actually very fresh. Um, the Lord just speaking to us early this morning said some things in that service I've never said before, and uh, I believe they were true. So as long as they're true, you can believe it. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to do our best to recap some of that and then build on to it today. Let's begin in the second chapter in the 20th verse. It says this, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Let's look at verse 21 together again. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be a vessel. That's you. You and I are vessels. This is a, a phrase or a word that Paul used in more than one spot. He wrote to the church at Corinth and talked to them about being vessels. When you look up this word, you find he's talking about, no offense, but cheap clay pottery. <laughs> That's what this word means. It literally means just cheap clay pottery. And what he's saying here is, is the value is not in the outward composition of the vessel. The value is what's inside it. Are you with me? So you and I are vessels. We are earthen vessels, cheap clay pottery when you just look at the outside. And that's so different than the way the rest of this world lives. The rest of this world is so focused on the outward man. I mean, billions of dollars a year a year are being spent on everything from diet programs to exercise programs and even all the way to surgery. I mean, people are having this nipped and that tucked, and it's just a multi, multi-billion dollar a year industry. And it's because what Paul wrote to them in Corinthians, he said, don't, don't be, let's see, how did he say it? Don't, be, don't lose your heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up just because the outward man is perishing. So many people are. They look at it and they're like, I'm not as young as I was. And they're trying to stretch things in the mirror. And they think, if I just had this tucked up here a little bit. And people can get addicted to that. They're, and it's all because they're losing heart because the outward man is perishing. But folks, guess what? The outward man is perishing. It's just going to happen. That's what's happening right now. I don't mean to depress you, but this guy out here is on his way to the ground. But the good news is... What's inside of you can be renewed day by day by day. So whenever, by the Spirit of God, Paul's writing to us about the, the vessel, you know it's not the, uh, what did he say, the excellence of the power is not of us. In other words, it's not about the outside of the vessel. It's not about the outward composition of it. The treasure is found in what's inside it. And he said, you can be a vessel for honor, sanctified. This will be important for us today. Sanctified just means set apart. You got a group of 100, but you take one out, and that one has been set apart. When Sarah and I used to youth pastor, we had, you know, 120 teenagers that we were ministering to on a weekly basis, and I used to tell them all the time, the same thing applies to them as it would to us, holiness never blends in. It's set apart. It's different by definition, by design, and by nature. It's different. Sanctified means to be set apart. And if you're set apart, then you are, what's the next word here? Useful for the master. Jesus can use you in this condition. I like the modern English version that says being fit for the master's use. Fit for the master's use. That word of the Lord came to me earlier this year. I turned 37, and I believe the Lord began talking to me about the next three years of my life. And he said, Jeremy, I want you fit by 40. Fit by 40. 
Now, one in- interpretation could mean, you know, you, you get, get in the gym, you start working out, you start eating better, and those things are good, they're fine. But how many of you realize when the Lord starts talking to you about change, it's never from the outside in, always from the inside out. And when you think about the, the same word in the original language that got translated both to fit and to useful, you realize that to be fit is to be of use to him. So when, when the Lord says to me, Jeremy, I want you fit by 40, on one hand, it really excites me because it, it, it causes me to realize something's coming. Something is on its way, and by the time I turn 40, it's going to be here. And he's saying, I want you ready for it when it gets here. And that's exciting to me to think Man, something's coming, some new direction and a a new phase, perhaps, of our ministry. Only now beginning to get ideas of what it might be. I really don't know. I'm standing here in front of you this morning not sure about it. I am sure that I'm supposed to be getting ready for it. But right on the other hand, it's not just a word of excitement, but I take it also as a word of warning. Because if he's telling me to get fit by then, by default, what's he saying? You're not fit right now. Not for that not for the next step, not for the next phase. There's some getting into shape that needs to be done, some conditioning, if you will, that needs to be done. Because one thing's for sure, Jesus loves me. This I know. How do you know? For the Bible tells me so. Over and over and over. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me. But one thing that you've got to recognize in light of this verse and many others is that just because he loves you doesn't necessarily mean he can use you. And I never want to hear Jesus say to me, Jeremy, I love you, but I just can't use you. My whole life is about being used by him. Our marriage, our family, our ministry, what I'm standing in front of you doing this morning, this is about letting Jesus use me. For your sake and others, that's what my life's about. And for him to say to me, I can't use you, would be the very last thing I ever want to hear on this earth. I want to be in condition for Jesus to use me. I want to be in shape. And what else did he say? Not just fit for his use, but prepared for every good work. The word prepared means made ready beforehand. So let me, again, give you this little window into my own life here. If 40 gets here and I haven't done anything in these next three years to get ready for it, I'm not prepared. I'm not ready beforehand. And there are certain things that require a lot of preparation. In other words, you can't get as ready as you need to be the day before. Right? I mean, what would you think about a champion fighter, a boxer, maybe MMA or something like that, some guy that, you know, he's, he's won the championship and he's got another fight lined up in six months from now. What if he does nothing but lay around for six months, right, and eat whatever he wants, sleep in, stay up late, lay on the couch, party, do nothing, no training, and then a day or two before the fight, he's like, well, I guess I better start working on something. This is not going to end well for him. Why? No preparation. So this is the condition we need to find ourselves in. Useful to the master, ready for the work. Somebody say, useful Useful. and ready. ready. This is the condition I want to be in. And you need to take the same attitude towards this that I took when the Lord spoke it to me because, hey, look, I'm here this morning standing on this platform behind this table telling you something's coming. Something's coming, and I believe that something's coming for this church. I believe that something's coming for your pastors, and I believe something's coming for you. But you're going to have to get ready for it. You must begin to get ready for it. I want you to look in the book of Luke with me, chapter 9. Again, some of this we went over in our first service. We'll touch on it as much as we can before we lay the next layer on top of it. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 it says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, someone said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Famous last words. These are the famous words of people who have just left another church. I served on my parents' church on their staff for a long time. And early on, on staff, when people would say that, you think, oh, man, this, this guy, this girl, we're, we're so blessed to have them. They're with, they told us they are with us forever. And you look up, 
a month or two later, and where are they? Nowhere to be found. And it got to the point where that was the last thing you wanted to hear from people. Hey, I'm with you forever. No, that's, those words are cursed. Don't say that. Why? Because there's a difference between those who say and those who do. There are talkers and there are doers. There are people who say they are committed, and then there are those who are committed. Now, here's somebody saying to Jesus, I'm with you. I'll follow you wherever you go. And you might think that Jesus would look back at that and say, wow, awesome. That's who I'm looking for. Get in line. But that's not what he said to him. As a matter of fact, in verse 58, it seems like he's almost trying to talk him out of it. He says, really? Because foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Not great recruiting, Jesus. You might need to polish that up a little bit. Bad in the marketing department. But is he being honest? Always. Is he being truthful? Is this the fact? Absolutely. This is going to make more sense to us here in a moment. Verse 59, he said to another, follow me. Somebody say, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said in verse 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is what? Say it out loud. Is what? Fit for the kingdom of God of God. Again, here you see that same word fit that we just saw in 2 Timothy, and it means useful. So let's analyze this for a moment. These people that Jesus are talking to, that he's just extended the invitation to follow me, do you suppose, is it safe to assume they are loved by him? Not a trick question, folks. Do you su- <laughs> G- does Jesus love these people? Yes. How do you know that? Again, because human blood is coursing through their veins. Therefore, God loves them. So they're loved by Jesus. Now let's add another layer to that. They're not only loved by him, they're called by him. These guys got that ultra-rare invitation that not everybody in that day got, and that was an eye-to-eye, face-to-face, personal invitation from Jesus to follow me. Now, not everybody got that. Precious few got that. There were those who heard it and responded to it. In one way, there was those who heard it, responded to it differently. The rich young ruler got the same invitation. You remember the guy that fell down in front of Jesus and said, you know, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And they had this conversation about the commandments, and he said, yeah, I've done all that. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So there you see it again. He loved him, but then he took it a step further, and he said to him, okay, you go and sell everything you've got. Give that to the poor. Come follow me. So you've got the love of God, and you've got the call of God. But what did this guy do? Scripture tells us he walked away sorrowful. He walked away sad because he had many possessions. In other words, Jesus said, follow me, and he, by his actions, said, no. So saying no to Jesus, saying no to the call of God on your life, man, that's, a, that's, that's something you don't want to do. But contrast that to what these guys have said. They haven't said no. They didn't tell him no. He said, follow me. And they said, Lord, let me first. Let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said, again, let the dead bury their dead, but you go. The emphasis here, the implication is you go now. You go now. So they're loved by God. They're called by God. But they said, okay, that sounds great. I'll follow you, but let me first. Me first. And both of them, if you look at it, said the exact same thing. Let me first. One wants to go home and bury his father. And you study this out and you find out it's not actually, his father's not actually dead. He's just kind of coming to the end of his life. And he wants to be there for that season in his life. And these are good things. These are not evil things unless... They come between you and doing what Jesus told you to do. To another one, he said, follow me. And this one said, I'll follow you. So he's not saying no. He's just saying, let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit 
for the kingdom of God. Now, I won't take all the time we took in the first service, but I will compare this to the same invitation that guys like Simon and Andrew and Levi, these other disciples of Jesus, the invitation that they got, same two words. Hey, you, follow me. Follow me. You can look at it in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 2, other places where Jesus came across these guys. What were they doing when he found them? A couple of them were fishermen, maybe more. One was a tax collector. The interesting thing, though, is they, when he found them, they were busy doing, this will sound funny, but busy doing what they do. They were in their career. They were in their life. And Jesus finds particularly these fishermen, and he says, follow me. Now, the invitation rarely ever comes with any more explanation than that. You ever notice that about God? It's not, follow me, and this is what's going to happen tomorrow, and this is what's going to happen the next day, and this is what's going to happen two years from now, and let me just spell it all out for you. Why? So that you have no qualms whatsoever about following. No. It's always just, follow me. Follow me. These fishermen are the only ones that got just a little more invitation. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Okay. What what does that even mean? Again, so it's not a lot of information, but I want you to compare it, contrast it really to what we've just read here in Luke chapter 9. The Bible says in in Mark chapter 1 that immediately they did two things. They left their nets... It goes on to say they left their father. Their father was in the boat with them. They're in the family business. They're in father's house. They're under father's care. And they left something. They left their net. They left their family. What was it here in Luke chapter 9 that these guys are running home to? They're going back to father, going back to family. And they're not, again, even telling Jesus, no, they're just saying, there's something else I got to do first. Let me ask you a question. If there's something you still have to do before you can do the thing God called you to do, are you ready? Simple question, are you ready? Sarah and I have been laughing about this lately. You know, for, we've been married nine years now, and pretty much for nine years, anytime we're going out at night, she and I are going on a date or something, or we've got somewhere to be, I'll ask her, hey, you ready? And she'll say, yeah, I just got to get dressed. <laughs> and I'm always like, it can't be yeah, and I got to get dressed. She's like, well, I'm almost ready. And I'm thinking to myself, almost ready is the exact same thing as what, gentlemen? Not ready. (laughs) Thank you, fellas. I appreciate that. It's the exact same thing as not ready. If there's still something to do before you're ready to go, you're not ready to go. (laughs) But that's exactly what these guys are saying to Jesus. I'll follow you, just not yet. I'm just not ready. But again, compare it to those guys who became his disciples, those guys who, watch out now, got used by Jesus. What did they leave? Again, two things, left the net and left the home, left Father's house. That net represents what? Safety, security, That guy who's walking across that tightrope in the circus, right? And he's four stories high. Ooh, wow, what great balance, what what risk he's taking. But if you look below him, there's this great big net down there. So really, is it that much of a risk? Is Is he really taking that big of a risk? No, because there's something there to catch him. There's something there to keep him from falling. And at the circus, that's what you want. A lot of little kids there. But what about some of these other guys that are just out of their mind daredevils that string these ropes across the Grand Canyon or between two skyscrapers with no net beneath them? That's risk. That is risk. And what did these guys leave? They didn't just leave a fishing net. They left a career. They left safety. They left a guaranteed income. And they left their family. 
Sarah and I know a little bit about this. When we felt like the Lord began dealing with us about launching out into our own ministry, we were on staff, not just with another ministry, at my grandparents' ministry, at my parents' church. Somebody say job security. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a good place to be. And shortly before that, we'd been given a raise, and, and we were making money that we had never made before, and that was great, that was wonderful, and all of a sudden the Lord starts talking to us about launching out, launching out, starting our own ministry. See, up until then, the partners of somebody else's ministry was paying our salary. And now the Lord's saying, hey, now I want you to go preach, and I want you to change your relationship with your family. I want you to go from dependent on them to partners with them. And so we prayed about it, we sought the Lord, and we, we submitted that to my grandparents, and they sought the Lord with us and said, this is good, this is God. But it took some faith, it took some courage to do what? Leave the net and leave the nest. What's the first thing God told Abram to do in Genesis chapter 12? Get out of your father's house. Folks, let's be honest, he was 70 years old. It was time. <laughs> It was time. But many times, that's what the Lord will instruct you to do. And it's not because your family's bad. He didn't have us leave because my family's bad. No, absolutely not. They are to this day some of our greatest supporters and encouragement and examples. But he had to get us to leave so that we're no longer dependent on them. Our safety's not in them. And we're not falling back on them. <coughs> you got to come to the place where you're saying, Lord, I have no net. It's not going to be, okay, I hear your call, but let me first make some extra money. Let me first start a family. Let me first get my business going. Let me first get the kids through school. Let me first go back to school myself. Let me first, let me first, let me first. If it's me first, you are not ready. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you that he said to these guys. I love you. But I can't use you. You know who he can use? People who are not me first, but are kingdom first. Kingdom first. Those are the people he can use. <clears throat> so I want to build on this now in the last few moments that we have here. Notice again exactly what he said to them in verse 62. He said, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is what? fit for the kingdom of God. Again, I love you, but I can't use you. Even though there's a call on your life, I can't use you to do what I've called you to do. Why? Because this, these people putting their hand to the plow, what did he say was the problem? Putting your hand to the plow and then what? Come on, what is it? Help me out. Looking back. Putting your hand to the plow, <coughs> excuse me, but then looking back. He can't use somebody who's got one hand on the plow while their head is turned back. <clears throat> no looking back. <coughs> Excuse me. Looking back is a dangerous proposition. Ask Lot's wife how that turned out. <laughs> if you're not familiar with that story, <clears throat> Abram, who I was just talking to you about, he had a nephew named Lot, and he had, he had a wife, and they moved to a town, a little town called Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, and this was not um, a very wholesome town to raise a family in. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, God couldn't let the town exist anymore, and you know the story. He sent messengers to Lot and said, you have got to get out of this town, and you've got to get out now, and he told them, he said, leave and don't look back. <clears throat> you got to leave this, and you cannot look back. But you go back and, and read the story, and uh, man, Lot tried to talk them out of it, and they said, no, we have got to go, and we've got to go now. This place, fire is falling, and you've got to get out of this city and into another one, and you've got to go now. And he said, you've got to go tell your family, go tell your sons-in-law. So he went, and the Bible said they thought he was joking. So they sat still. And it says, the next morning, as Lot lingered, are you kidding me? <coughs> Fire's about to fall? 
man, you're hanging out. He lingered, and they finally got a hold of him and said, we have got to go now. Leave now and do not look back. So they're hightailing it out of town, and fire and brimstone and sulfur starts to fall on that city. And what happened? Lot's wife, what'd she do? Look back. But it wasn't just a look back. Other translations, and when you study it out, you realize it's not just looking at it, it's looking at it longingly. She was looking back longingly at it. That place had gotten in her. And the sin and the depravity had gotten into her in such a way that she could not unhook from it. And she's looking back longingly on it. And what happened? She turned into what the Bible called a pillar of salt. To put it in a word, she became what she was beholding. She looked back on it and longingly, and that thing was, that place was still so in her that she became that. Hmm. Don't look back. The children of Israel coming out of Egypt, God had rescued them out of bondage, out of slavery. Right? This is a great day. He rescued them, and not subtly, if you remember. They did not sneak out of town in the cover of night. This was a major, magnificent manifestation of God Almighty, and he gloriously delivered these people, and he brought them out, and just a few days later, when they're standing at the edge of the Red Sea, they're complaining and saying, we got to go back. How many times, look it up, how many times these people said, we got to go back, we got to go back, we got to go back. It was better for us in Egypt. Are you out of your mind? It was not better for you in Egypt. You were a slave. There was somebody beating you every day of your life, and you have got to be out of your mind crazy to think that that is better than anything. And what a trick of the devil. Huh? God has rescued you out of stuff, out of sin that had you in bondage, out of mindsets that kept you crippled, out of, out of bondage that had just kept you still and unproductive in your life. And God, bless God, pulled you out of it, rescued you out of it, and not subtly, gloriously, you were addicted and then one day you weren't. And that's happened for many people. How foolish would it be to look back and to think, oh man, that was better. Those relationships were better. Those friendships were better. And try to go back to that. If you're looking back, you're not fit. Why? Because faith looks forward. Faith has the future on its mind all the time. I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Interesting when you look that up that the word thoughts in that original, original language got translated both to the word thoughts and to the word plans. Folks, you can't plan the past, can you? You can't make a to-do list today of everything you're going to do yesterday. It doesn't work like that. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that when God is thinking about you, he's got the plan on his mind. Plans belong to the future. That's what's on God's mind. Get it on yours. You want to be used by him, you're going to have to let go of some stuff. You're going to have to let go of some things that once had a grip on you, some things that once had its hooks in you. And maybe they were things that were unholy, maybe they were things that were killing you, or perhaps they were just things that you thought were keeping you safe, things that you found security in. There's something for all of us to let go of and someone for all of us to embrace and we are of no use to him holding on to the past. Now, Jesus, the example he gave us here was setting our hand to the plow. He said, no one setting their hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom. Why would somebody who has set their hand to the plow look back to the house? Huh? Why would somebody who's doing the plowing all of a sudden turn around and look back and want to be going inside, going back into daddy's house, going back into mama's house? Why? Why, why would that happen? Because this is hard. I don't know if you've ever plowed anything. I don't know if you've ever started 
anything. Why don't you ask a pastor who's ever planted a church, is plowing ground hard? Why don't you ask a farmer who's actually plowed ground? Is that hard work? Man, you are, you are digging down into hard earth that has been um, impenetrable by the seed. I mean, you throw the seed on it, and it's so hard and packed that nothing can penetrate. So you got to get down deep and dig it up and cultivate it, and you got to do that row after row after row after row. And if this ground is ever going to produce anything, it's going to have to be plowed. And people think, wow, I want fruit. I want harvest. I want vegetable. I want crops. I want everything this ground can produce. And they think, okay, well, it's going to take some plowing. Sure, I can do that. Start to plow. And it's like, dad, gum. <laughs> Plowing's hard. And it's not long before, what are you doing? Man, everybody's sitting up in the house. Mama just made iced tea. I thought I heard the lunch bell. Oh, man. But Jesus is saying, look, you're not fit for the kingdom if you're going to start something and give up the first moment it gets challenging. I can't use that kind of person. I can't use them. I'm going to show this to you in Scripture. I've got just a couple of minutes left. Look at the book of Acts with me. Chapter 12. Turn quick. Acts chapter 12, I'll show you this played out. In verse 25, we'll read a few verses here into chapter 13. It says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. Other translations, they returned to Jerusalem. They'd been out doing their ministry. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So it's these three guys, Saul, Barnabas, and John Mark. Now in the church, verse 1 of chapter 13, that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, who said this? The Holy Spirit said this, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit's not going to say anything of his own. He's going to take what he's heard me say. He's going to take of mine and say it to you. So when the Holy Spirit's saying it, tell me who's really saying it. Jesus is speaking. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul. Remember what we read in 2 Timothy? What kind of vessel gets used? One that's been sanctified one that's been set apart and separated from the crowd? Can you see that's what's happening here? What's the Holy Spirit saying? What's Jesus saying? I can use these guys. I can use these guys. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they had arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So it's these same three guys. They've been separated. They've been sanctified because Jesus said, I can use you. And now they've set sail, and it's one stop after another. It's on the boat, it's off the boat. It's preaching in one city, it's getting back on the boat, going and preaching in another one. It says in verse 6, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus, who was with the proconsul. Uh, And this man... I'm going to kind of skip through it. This man called for Barnabas and Saul, sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So what's going on here? There is spiritual warfare taking place. This thing just got real. Right? They've left Jerusalem. Now, if you were to back up and Acts, really the only thing we know about where they were in Jerusalem was that that's where John Mark's mom lived. It says that to us in chapter 12. When, you remember when Peter got out of prison because the angel broke him out? He came and knocked on the door, and that young girl came to the door and couldn't believe it was him and didn't even let him in and ran inside and told everybody that he was there. You remember all this happening? Well, that was John Mark's mom's house that she knocked on that door. 
But now they're out of Jerusalem, and they're in these cities, and it's bonkers out here, man. You got demon-possessed people. You got sorcerers, and they're all coming against these guys. And Saul in verse 9, who's called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, I love it, and said, Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. The proconsul believed, yeah. I bet they did. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord, verse 13, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Pergam, Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. What did he do? He went back. Where did he go? Back home. Mama's house. He went back to Mama's house. The scripture doesn't give us a lot of reason why, but all we know is what immediately preceded it, and it was intense out there. This was not church like it is back home in Jerusalem, where everybody's happy to see you. Now we're talking to demon-possessed people. Now we're talking to sorcerers, and they're actively trying to stop us and or kill us. And John, for all we know, was like, uh, this is not what I signed up for. I'm going home. And he left. He went back. In chapter 15, in verse 36, it says, After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. So you got an argument taking place here. And it says in verse 39 that the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. These two guys, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas whose name means son of encouragement, these two guys got in a fight so intense. The Bible says that it was so sharp. One Greek scholar I listened to to says it very well could have been translated that a fist fight broke out over this. This word sharp literally means to have a stick that's sharpened and it's just poking and it's poking and it's poking. That's the kind of contention that was going on. And Paul said, you see this in other translations, Paul said, it's not fitting, it's not fitting that one who left us should get to go with us again. In other words, what's he saying? I can't use him. I can't use somebody who's going to put his hand to the plow, so to speak, and turn, about, turn around and go back home the moment this gets hard. Now tell me who the rest of the book of Acts follows. Paul. Paul. Why? What's he saying? He's not ready to be out here. He might be good at home, great guy, Christian guy, loves the Lord, may even have a call of God on his life, but he ain't ready for this. Why? It gets intense out here. And if we're the kind of people that are going to throw in the towel the moment it gets challenging, we are not fit, nor are we ready. And Jesus is saying, hey, I love you, and I've called you but I can't use you. I need you to be stronger than that. But here's the good news. I know this all sounds kind of heavy, but here's the good news, and I'll wrap it up with this. If you go back to 2 Timothy, near the same place we were looking before, but look at chapter 4 this time. Look at what he says in verse 9, writing to Timothy. He said, be diligent to come to me quickly. Why? Because Demas, somebody else, has forsaken me having loved this present world. Same thing happened to Demas that happened to Lot's wife and has happened to so many other believers. The world just got its hooks in him. And he was with Paul, he was serving God, but he loved the world more. First John tells us if you, if you love God, then you can't love the things of the world. Anyone who loves the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the love of the Father is not in him. And this guy bailed on Paul. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, departed for Thessalonica. 
Look at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. So what does he say? Get Mark. This is the same Mark that how many years before he had said, I can't use him. What does he say about him now? Get Mark. Bring him with you, for he's useful to me in the ministry. This is good news, folks. Because we read about Mark, John Mark, all those years before, not useful. And now he is. What's that tell us? Something changed. Something in Mark changed. That's encouraging to me and you. Something in us can change. Maybe we're not ready right now. And honestly, when I hear the Lord say to me, Jeremy, fit by 40, it means something's coming, and whatever it is, I'm not ready for it. But the good news is I can get ready for it. And so can you. I guarantee you this. Whatever's coming is going to require more strength from me. It's going to require a strong heart, strong soul, strong faith, strong body. And it may be strength that I don't yet possess, but you better believe that every day of my life for the next three years is about bulking up, if you will. (laughs) Feeding on the Word of God so that I am strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, so that my youth is renewed, so that my strength is increased. What about you? Do you have the desire to be used by Him? then you better know this. There's going to come some plowing that needs to be done. And you can't be caught looking back at the house every time it gets challenging. What are you going to have to do? You can't depend on your own strength. You're going to have to dig down and find his strength within you. When it gets challenging, it's not time to run home. And there have been those times, even in our ministry, since we launched out in our, on our own. And I have even said to Sarah, did we do the right thing? Should we still be there? Should we still be on staff? I thank God for a strong wife who has looked at me and said, with all due respect, shut up. <laughs> Essentially, I mean, she's never said that, but she said, no, look what the Lord has done. Look what he's done for us. And if he got us this far, he'll get us all the way. Amen. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Praise God. Aaron, come on up. We love you guys. Let's just pray together over this group, and I want to just seal this word in our hearts today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over this congregation. I pray over this awesome church, and I thank you, Lord, for taking what we've heard today, rooting it deep down on the inside, and we commit to you let go of the, to let go of the net, to let go of the house. We're not returning to anything that is seemingly safe or so-called security. We are embracing you, Jesus, and your plan, and you will be the one that lifts us. You will be the one that catches us if we fall. You'll be the one that sets us back on our feet. You'll be the one that sustains us all the way because we are strong in you and in the power of your might. In Jesus' name.